Cool. So just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Satish. I've been with Bass for a few years. Um, by profession, I'm a team manager. I, I manage tech teams. Um, and I've been part of this group for some time and been part of some star parties and things like that. So I'll be moderating the event today. So looking forward for an interactive discussion. Uh, please, uh, please feel free to ask questions and uh, make the best use of it. So what is this all about? Uh, people who, who have attended our previous session probably already know. Um, uh, given that people, so many people have joined BAS recently, especially this year, um, and we saw a trend where, where the new beginners um, in the in the chat groups um, sometimes they they are not finding the right platform to ask questions because many of the discussions are maybe complicated and you know uh, more technical. So we thought of doing an open house uh, back in January specifically for beginners so that they can ask their questions. Um, and there is no set standard, there is no set format to this. We have some general themes. I'll go over the themes. We have a panel. Um, and we will put those questions to those panels, panel members. Now, the questions are of two kinds. One uh, are scripted questions, where, which already have been submitted by all of you. We had actually shared a Google form some time back. So thanks for those questions. So I'll be mixing up those questions uh, with various themes. And towards the second half, we will open up for questions from live stream and maybe people who have joined the groups, uh, joined the meeting. So we'll take questions impromptu. Um, that is the simple format we're going to follow. Um, you know, so we're going to keep it to two hours, depending on the kind of uh, questions we are having. Um, so this time, uh, one difference would be we will also include astrophotography. The last open house was did not include astrophotography. In fact, this time it's going to be a little heavy on astrophotography. I would say half off, depending again on the questions that come in. But we we are going to include photography as well this time. Um, so some of the things and questions you, you, you may see that it's going to repeat a little bit uh, because we have a different panel and we have different set of people, but I'll try to avoid repetition wherever possible. Um, and I can, I'll quote uh, things where if, if things have already been answered, maybe you can go back and check the, the first session that we did. Okay. So with that, I think we can get started. Any questions before we go ahead and get in the panelists? All right, cool then. Uh, so let's introduce the panels for today. So we got uh, two of them joining and they need no introduction. I think people have seen their work a lot within the group. So first I want to welcome uh, Prabhakaran, uh, also Prabhu. And so Prabhu, I, I think everybody would have seen um, pictures and images that he, he shares on, on the Telegram group. So he's very much into astrophotography, also astrophysics. Um, he's got pictures of deep sky objects, of planets, of the moon, so many, many things out there. So, and he's also an educational trainer. So welcome, Prabhu. He's, uh, he stays in the UAE, so he's joining us from there. So welcome, Prabhu. Thank you, thank you. Okay, and then we have uh, Avinash Singh. Um, Avinash um, has a PhD in astrophysics, and he is also an educational uh, uh, motivator, and uh, he's also into education. Uh, he's also into astrophotography, a lot of uh, imaging, et cetera, that he has done. So we'll look at some of the work later on. Um, Avinash also has kind of changed um, his career from from being an engineer to getting into astronomy and astrophotography and things like that his uh, specialization is actually supernova so any anyone has tough questions on supernova this is the chance okay so welcome avinash yeah hi, hi Satish. hello everyone Thanks. else cool so yeah uh, excited to have you both here uh, like, like I said, this is the first time we're talking about photography, so um, I'm sure people will have a lot of questions. So with that, uh, let's get started. So I would probably go with the same question that I asked last time to begin the things, which is um, how did you guys get into astronomy, astrophotography, and how did your journey uh, begin? And how did it continue? Uh, how has it been? And any, any opening remarks that you want to share? Yeah. So let's start with you, Prabhu, and then we can go to Avinash. Sure, sure. So uh, since my childhood, uh, I've been seeing stars. Yeah, Prabhu, your uh, sound is very low, actually. You're not able to hear much. 
how about now am i audible it's a little better okay so i seriously started astronomy uh, around 8 years ago you know after finishing my engineering uh, like avinash i also started as as an engineer and then i changed my career although i didn't pursue like phd uh, just uh, after completing my bachelor's of engineering in electricals and electronics then uh, i did a diploma course in astronomy and astrophysics then um, i joined as an astronomy educator uh, uh, in space india then i worked there for 3 years and then i moved to uae here i'm working as an education coordinator sir volume is very low okay i'll uh, try to this am i audible now yeah, it's much better oh, yeah now it is okay right right i think again the problem is with the microphone i guess anyways so uh, i'll start from the beginning so i started astronomy seriously 8 uh, years ago after finishing my bachelor's of engineering uh, uh, although i didn't pursue till phd i changed my career to do diploma in astronomy and astrophysics So then I joined a company in India called Space India, where I worked as an astronomy educator for the past uh, about three years. Then I moved to UAE. Uh, here I'm working in a museum as an education coordinator, uh, where I'm handling sub different subjects besides astronomy, uh, like archaeology, anthropology, and paleontology as well. So we have educational workshops and educational programs designed for schools and universities and general public. <clears throat> so uh, my hobby and passion is astronomy and then also i started doing astrophotography along with that so uh, my first telescope was uh, like in 2012 i guess i bought a 5 inch newtonian reflector telescope and buying the first telescope was a big deal for me because uh, right after finishing your college you know you will not have much of a cash to get a telescope like 5 inch so you have to save a lot and uh, to just to buy a telescope uh, right after finishing my college then i joined a job i worked for like one year just to save the money and then after saving the money i bought the telescope because before that i tried to watch objects uh, when i started astronomy like after reading basics and everything so i was so curious to see these objects through the telescope so i tried my best but uh, there were no telescopes near my hometown uh, there were no planetariums as such so uh, the only uh, way was to buy a telescope and see it so it was a uh, like one one and a half years long wait and after buying the telescope and seeing the moon saturn's rings for the first time so it hooked me up like forever so ever since uh, i've been doing observational astronomy whenever i get free time and also i balance it with astrophotography so the main uh, intention that i started astrophotography is to showcase uh, what astronomy is to the public now you can do public observations you can do events and you can do talks but uh, pictures and videos speaks a lot so it uh, seeing those amazing pretty pictures uh, people will easily get into it so um, then i started posting pictures of moon i started with a basic you know mobile camera just by uh, keeping the mobile on the top of the eyepiece the a focal photography method i was just clicking images of moon and saturn and i started posting in facebook facebook groups and then slowly slowly i developed uh, tricks and uh, knowledge from many various forums and facebook group and uh, indian astro photography group is one of the uh, you know major group at that time where uh, i learned a lot from many astro photographers uh, both in uh, planetary and also in deep sky astro photography as well so then uh, i started to buy like uh, equipment one by one which was very difficult uh, you know unfortunately astrophotography is an expensive hobby but still you can do pretty decent astrophotography uh, with uh, basic equipment like a, uh, like a stock dslr and a kit lens you can do a lot so that's how i started and then um, after moving to uae here i could get more equipment so Uh, i'm doing it uh, a lot now so this is my uh, journey and it's uh, it's it's not it's, it's a very slow journey and it, the progress is great so i like exploiting the equipment and moving on to the next so that's what i've been doing 
Awesome, Prabhu. That's great. And I'm sure people have a lot of questions on hearing what you just said. Uh, what equipments did you buy? How did you get started? Where did you get the information from? Um, you know, and so on and so forth. So we'll come to all those topics uh, one by one, uh, just just for the people who have joined. So we'll we'll come back to that as well. So yeah, thanks, Prabhu. Uh, we will touch upon some of the points you mentioned. Again, okay. Uh, Avinash, you want to go next? Yeah, hi. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the open house uh, organized by BAPS. Uh, and thanks to all the volunteers who have given me the opportunity to be a part of this. Um, so to begin with, I would like to start that my love for astronomy dates back to my school days. Like, I think it was my 10th standard where a lot of these uh, National Geographic and uh, Discovery Channel documentaries showed up, you know, uh, all these deep sky mysteries and uh, trying to unveil them uh, one by one. So I fell in love with astronomy back then and um, started admiring physics a lot more. I was not really a studious student. Stu like I used to be, you know, one of those bottom half uh, kids where uh, like I really didn't have any idea of what I was going to do next in my future. But then I think the love for astronomy raised an interest in physics, which happened during that 10 to 11 transition time, you know. And that's when I started admiring physics more. Uh, so I prepared, uh, so I was basically, I took science uh, in my 11th standard and continued that for 12th. But then when I wanted to take BSc because I was interested, then, you know, the typical uh, conservative uh, mindset of, uh, uh, like, you know, you want to do something which will save you for the future. So I ended up doing engineering, you know, BSc is a bit more tricky route. You have to at least do, you know, five years BSc plus MSc because you won't be getting any jobs based on your BSc. So I ended up doing engineering. Uh, but then that, that, that only made me solidify what I wanted to do in the future. Uh, it just made me, uh, you know, like confirm that I don't want to be an engineer in the future, but I would most likely want to do sciences. So, uh, I think that was a gateway where I, so I used to continue pursuing and reading astronomy, you know, and tech so that, you know, whenever I have to leave, uh, my current degree. So I didn't end up dropping. I finished it and then I applied for a PhD. So I kind of dropped for a year preparing all the physics courses because you have to compete with, you know, people who are studying physics for five years. Uh, and then ended up joining IISC, uh, which in collaboration with IA, I did my PhD in astronomy and astrophysics. Uh, and as Satish already mentioned, so I, my primary goal of research in um, astronomy was supernovae. So I pr primarily worked on core collapse supernovae. And if you have any questions, please feel free to drop in. And I think that's where, because I was doing observational aspects, uh, I started uh, falling in love with the aspects of astronomy, you know, because I had minimal expertise before that in my engineering, or maybe not because of like, not so dark skies before that, or, you know, but then I started realizing, okay, the extent of the vastness of the universe, you know, and then I'm actually being a part of that community made you think, you know, there are so many things which professional astronomers don't do. We just delve into those physics or equations, but we forget about, you know, you know, the, I don't know, the, 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 the reason why we fell in love with the, you know, the field. So that made me want to try out astroph astrophotography, but I was in Bangalore at that time and uh, the PhD load and mixed up with the not so good skies uh, didn't really motivate me to start out. But then I visited Hanle. Um, I visited Hanle not for my work, but as because I know that I host the HCT observatory there. So, you know, I visited Hanle and exploring bottle one skies for the first time in my life showed me what it can be. So I, I bought a lens. I bought this Tokina 11 to 16 just for that purpose. Uh, so I had a very, uh, I had a secondhand DSLR prior to that. And um, I still continue to use that. I took that lens and pictured, uh, like pictured Milky Way. That was the first astrophotography image and the, and some starters around that. And that motivated me that if I ever moved to a darker sky location, I would start out, you know, trying astrophotography. And that happened in my first postdoc, uh, post COVID because, uh, my PhD basically finished during the COVID times in June, 2020. And, uh, and hence there was no, there was no uh, luck in applying abroad. Uh, so I had to go to move to Nenital, which apparently has great skies. And that's about the time when I joined Bass group. And I think uh, the likes of Kirti, Vishwa and all other people, they helped me out in deciding the gear I would want. Because there, are, there were two routes I could have taken, either a portable route, a portable setup, or either, you know, take a heavy mount and, you know, 
but then limited funds because phd does not let you save a lot of money <laughs> because of the stipend income uh, you know i ended up um, choosing a portable setup which i still continue to own uh, to this day so yeah um, i would uh, like to thank them for actually you know helping me decide what i would and i'm uh, uh, i'm like, glad that i am a member of that and uh, getting the opportunity to be a part of the session so hopefully uh, we'll get to answer some questions uh, which other other people who are beginning in this field have for us so yeah that's it cool thanks thanks avnash yeah. so couple of questions before we get into how beginners can go ahead um so uh, one is i'm i was a little curious to understand how much time do you guys actually spend in in doing this because i keep seeing images coming like once a week you guys are sharing something and and each of those images look uh, amazing and the amount of time spent is a lot um having done a little bit of uh, stargazing myself i know it must have taken a lot of time so a how much time do you spend and b how do you manage that with work that you guys are doing outside astronomy and um, uh, when do you sleep so uh, maybe you can go one by one <laughs> I think Prabhu, go ahead. I, I think I'll, uh, I'll. Okay, I'll start. Sir. Yeah. So that's a very difficult question to answer. Uh, but so doing astro astronomy and astrophotography is not very easy. Uh, you know, if you have a work, if you have a full time work. Uh, here after moving back back in india uh, it was also not very difficult for me because my profession was uh, into the same field astronomy and i was uh, teaching astronomy so i was always carrying telescopes going to dark skies taking the students so uh, i was doing a lot of astro astrophotography and astronomy along with my work and here after moving to ua uh, where astronomy is not the only subject where i deal with other subjects as well so uh, then it became very difficult but i had night shifts uh, for overnight campings where we used to show stars and stuff so i started doing astrophotography during my overnight shifts and the next day becomes a day off so you get to have three day offs in a week so in, which means you can spend a lot of nights and also i started getting more and more ownet shifts from my other colleagues i used to snatch all the shifts from my colleagues just to do astrophotography so i ended up having tons and tons of data so for the past not for the past two years like till 2020 it went well but after that my shifts got cancelled ownet shifts got cancelled we started we stopped ownet camping so uh, then i had to spend the nights during my weekdays so i would stay back till early morning and then go home sleep i have different shifts so my shift starts from 9 ends at 5 second shift is 2 to 10 pm so i mostly do 2 to 10 pm so i get some sleep in the day time and then uh, just quickly go to office do the work and then again whenever you have free time so you do it and it, this goes peacefully until you get married so once you get married that's it there is a a big full stop and then you can stretch it to comma if you can <laughs> you know with the permission from the wife so after getting married i uh, i couldn't go much but uh, my wife is you know uh, she is supportive so i'm going like up to 3 days a week uh, during new moon cycle like 4 5 days uh, in that cycle so that's how i manage and uh, sleep wise like uh, the sleeping time is maximum like 7 8 hours uh, on a non astro night uh, during an astro night it's like 4 5 hours Wow, that's awesome. So you answered my next question also, which is how things change after marriage. But uh, that's cool. <laughs> so, Avinash, yeah, over to you. Yeah, yeah. Thankfully, I don't have to answer that because <laughs> I still have that uh, to happen. Okay. Uh, so my my schedule is not as hectic as Prabhu's because you see tremendous amount of images being you know posted by Prabhu. Like he has this plethora of uh, uh, stuff going on. Like he posts images so many times a week. Uh, well um, there's no comparison i think there is no astrophotographer at least an indian who does so much hard work uh, uh, and puts it into his astrophotography uh, there's no comparison so for me it's like so morning time would be again you know your work time because i currently have teaching duties so i have to take up that and uh, just the work 
stuff the research which comes with that but the evening time because you know this is a hobby this is a hobby which is close to your work so as soon as the uh, work you know finishes at 5 or something and then you have your tea this is where the time begins okay time to learn new techniques new processing techniques you know that's the first thing because i'm still new to this field there are a lot of things i have to learn so the, the time i kind of invest in nowadays is mostly on you know watching more and more tutorials reading more articles you know understanding the caveats which are pro- or the problems i'm facing with images so i just spend those time you know because there's a lot of time between the time you actually have this evening tea and you sleep so you know even if you give 2 to 3 hours a day it it, it actually boils down to a lot of uh, time for you if you think about it uh, so yeah i i think give a lot of time post uh, my work schedule and um, and i think that takes up the majority of my basically the secondary time post my work time so yeah that's exactly how i manage it and there's nothing else because i don't, i don't have that many images to post for but like whenever i do i like i work for it at least maybe you know five hours give give it time give it a uh, due credit because uh, i think there's a lot to learn in this field there's no ending um, you can always become better at it so yeah just learn new stuff that's what i invest my time on yeah cool awesome all right um one more one more question uh, before we go to the next section which is uh, both of you are into education and you you uh, you're doing some things with education as well so could you touch upon a little bit upon that exactly what it is and um, you know uh, how, how do you do that and uh, is it um, accessible to everybody just to get a flavor for people who are who are hearing you so uh, very briefly if you could talk about that um maybe abhinash should start with you and then you can go to prabhu yeah um so um to start with like i'm not an avid science communicator but uh, because uh, i was doing my phd and the fact that this is what actually motivated me to join for my astronomy and astrophysics we used to do outreaches uh, when i was in iisc or even in iaa for example iisc was my first year of phd and then i joined for my research in iaa we used to go out to schools because school students are really fascinated you know um, especially at that young age uh, and i'm talking about not 11th 12th standard i'm talking about like 7th 8th standard students and they're really fascinated by looking at uh, you know these objects through the telescope just a small telescope keep a small refractor and uh, show them the moon or even a small little we used to carry this five uh, four inch i think four inch newtonian and uh, so whenever we conducted these outreaches in you know, outskirts not like big bidri and there are few other places outskirts of bangalore where you have really good dark skies uh showing them you know that milky way is actually visible from those places so uh that actually uh, uh is the way i have communicated with you know the students who are in their school days and uh, try to motivate them into uh, astronomy because this 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 is the that is aspect missing which i didn't find in my school days and i can speak for it so i think if uh, more and more students and even teachers who are teaching them you know at the school level are exposed to such uh, aspects about as it's not so difficult to observe it's not it's not something which is very complicated understanding astronomy is more of the time you spend on it rather than you know uh, the difficulty it uh, with which comes to this so yeah it was more about uh, trying to get uh, the resources to these people so we used to also sell uh, not sell out basically but give out uh, these uh, paper made uh, you know uh, t- uh i should call them the factor tubes so that they can actually observe back at their uh, home places so i think uh, that was my uh, short experience with the uh, community communicating with the school students and motivating them to you know astronomy and physics per se because it was not only limited to astronomy but the sciences which lead to astronomy so yeah that's my short uh, stint in uh, science cool. communication yeah yeah and i completely agree i think as a school people children are so much interested and you bring in a good point i i really don't know why schools don't do astronomy a little bit more i, I really don't understand that and uh, it is really something which you discovered accidentally at least that's what happened to my generation of people maybe things are changing now with internet and everything but yeah i mean it should be somehow brought into the curriculum um cool. um yeah uh, prabhu anything you want to add Sure. So uh, there are two things that I want to highlight. Uh, if you have interest in astronomy or astrophysics, if you want to reach the highest level, if you want to become a professional in the field, 
then you have to obviously have to do uh, PhD in astronomy or astrophysics. But there is another uh, path as well. Like if you want to, if you have interest and if you want to educate astronomy, you can choose the other path. So I chose the other path, although I was very interested in doing the professional uh, astronomy and astrophysics. But at the time of the year, when I was trying, I couldn't. So I chose the other path. Uh, and for this, you don't need to have, you know, uh, a degree in physics or something. As long as you have uh, knowledge in astronomy, as long as you have uh, basic education and uh, good communication, you can be a science communicator. So uh, the, the main thing is you have to take that astronomy knowledge to all the masses and you have to just simplify the things and break it down to the school kid, break it down to the public and you can take astronomy uh, very well. And fortunately in this time of the generation, you know, uh, many people are getting awareness in astronomy, particularly because of science, science, communicator, science communicators like us. And schools are also considering astronomy as one of the important subjects. Hopefully, in, in, hopefully uh, soon schools might be taking astronomy as a curriculum as well. So uh, that's why uh, I moved to science communication rather than pursuing it. Uh, and then uh, after becoming a science communicator, I started teaching astronomy uh, to uh, school kids of all ages, right from you know uh, second grade till like 12th grade. And I saw a uh, lot of differences. The curiosity that young minds has the scientific temperament that you have to create is like phenomenal. And uh, once you reach that point, you know, once you know what to tell them and how to make them interested, then uh, they will follow it like anything. So then I saw many uh, kids, school kids started astronomy and astrophotography. Uh, then uh, I decided to just stay in the same field, just educate everyone and uh, also, I started astrophotography for the same reason to just hook everyone into astronomy. Right. And I think all the volunteers will, will probably agree. We've all seen that happening in schools whenever we go. So, yeah. All right. Thank you. So, let's yeah. move on then. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I just wanted to add one thing. So, I think uh, along with the school students, which are one of the part I forgot to mention is I think a lot of uh, myths and um, stereotypes which go along with you know the mixture of astronomy and astrology with people yep. so uh, i remember conducting a few events um, so there was this uh, lunar eclipse i think in 2018 uh, january if i'm not wrong uh, you guys can correct me uh, which happened in uh, which was visible through bangalore uh, and i think uh, we uh, as a team from ia organized this outreach at uh, lalbag and many people i don't even know the count but i think at least maybe a 500 or so came in um, and as Prabhu mentioned, uh, the kids especially, they're very curious. The questions they ask, you know, about how this is happening or why this is happening, why is it red, why is it short dead for the short period, well, wh whatever the reason is. And then these uh, question related to the myths, you know, why people do not eat. So we brought in bananas for people to eat. And I was like, and we were showing them, you know, nothing is happening to us. So we are, we are fine. We are healthy. The eclipse has passed. We are living and there's nothing happening to us. So to bust those myths, uh, it's, I think the importance of then science communication uh, is even more strengthened because you don't want people to fall into those uh, false beliefs which are there in the society uh, due to certain reasons. But again, um, uh, these outreaches or these uh, you know sessions reaching out to the public uh, and uh, also help you know bust those uh, myths which are there in a society. You know, okay, yeah, that's all I wanted to add. No, it's a fair point. It's a fair point. <laughs> we see that all the time. So completely agree to that. All right. So I, I'll move on there. Actually, I had a bunch of other questions, but in the interest of time, um, since we also began a little late, I'm moving on to how can beginners, <clears throat> what are the suggestions for beginners? How do they start? What should they do? What should they not do? So <clears throat> I would first of all suggest uh, um, people to check out the previous open house as well because there were very interesting points that were shared on this question, uh, very good tips. So definitely it'll help you, um, <clears throat> uh, but we'll take the same questions again, some of them. But I do want to start with a little different question and I really like this question, it was submitted on the Google form. Uh, so somebody was asking, how do you guys pack and stay safe in remote places for dark skies? And also what locations um, would you suggest for beginners? So, um, Yep, Avinash, if you want to go ahead with that or Prabhu, either way. 
I think you're on mute. I think I think Prabhu is like the perfect person for this. He travels a lot to remote places. I think. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I'll I'll start. I'll. Uh, so the there are sort of things that you have to keep in the checklist if you're uh, uh, concerned about the safety. Uh, I'll I'll tell a few incidents also along with the story. So don't first of all don't go alone if uh, if it is not safe if you are going somewhere which is not accessible by anyone. And if you feel that uh, that the place is not safe because of people or because of animals or snakes or something, just don't go alone, and uh, bring a companion. Uh, either uh, go in like two vehicles or one vehicle. Just take a companion with you. And there are some safety precautions. If you feel that that place has some snakes, because generally what we do, we go to very dark place uh, out in the field near the know mountains in the middle of the forest where we have some clearance so definitely there'll be some some insects or some uh, like snakes animals scorpions so use <clears throat> some safety gears what i usually do is here in uae so wherever i go uh, mostly it's desert and there we have uh, scorpions we have uh, vipers venomous snakes so i <clears throat> i generally have uh, some safety gear like i have a snake gaiter it's like a it's like a, a protective cloth for your just for your leg so if it bites you know the the teeth the teeth won't go much deeper in so that will protect you from snake bites and scorpion bites and there are uh, some other things as well like you have if you you have to know the nearest hospital uh, from your location that you have to check it in the map and you need to know how far it is and if you if anything happens you need to know how long it will take to drive there and also uh, you have to give uh, information of your location and uh, uh, expected time to come back from that location to your home to your close ones like your friends and family so if anything happens you know they'll be aware so they'll come looking for you and also you have to dress properly for the weather if it is winter make sure that you pack your clothes very well have some uh, warm warm gears that will help you out if it is too cold uh, it's it's uh, in india the the temperature difference isn't much but uh, it's good to know and uh, i'll share a few of the uh, the videos and pictures that i have captured so far just to give you an idea how crazy the the things could go if you are in the field is it okay if i share the screen yeah sure go ahead bro let me know if you can see it yeah we yeah so this is the snake guider was talking about so uh, this will protect you and i have a picture of it so uh, this was captured in my recent trip to a bottle two scale so you can see me wearing that snake guide is on the ladder and i'll show you the real incidents uh, last year during the time of new ways comet you know just a sec yeah so this is a oman carpet viper i stepped on the tail and fortunately it didn't bite me but it's one of the most venomous uh, snakes in uae and then this is a this is the most venomous snakes in uae it's uh, horn viper arabian horn viper so there is another one it just came to my telescope this is a scorpion and dropped this crossing kada and then there is another snake this is clifford snake so i didn't go to these creatures they just came to me and uh, the, the first one which i almost stepped on it so it was it was so scary how do i stop yeah so these are the safety things that you have to consider and also uh, uh, if, you, if, if if there is also another question i guess someone asked about the location how do you choose the location in terms of uh, observing and astrophotography so choose the location not between the mountains uh, 
preferably on the top of the mountain on high altitude or in front of the mountain where you have uh, a flat ground. So that also affects the astronomical seeing. If it is in between the mountains, because of the temperature difference and the density difference in the atmospheric layers, you won't have a perfect seeing. So uh, you won't see objects very clearly. It won't appear very sharp. So that's one more thing that they want to add if you are looking for a perfect location in terms of safety and also in terms of observation. Yep. Also, I think some of the things you mentioned are also very much relevant when somebody is doing very serious astrophotography, they go to very remote places. Um, what about if they, most of the people will go somewhere near to the city, uh, you know, in city conditions. So some of the things I want to probably add there is, uh, you know, simple things like take water bottle with you, take something for the mosquitoes and don't eat heavy before you go out. Uh, uh, that's what I could relate to. And also, what do you think about uh, farmhouses? Let's say if you know somebody, a farmhouse and pretty much, of course, you won't find great skies, but a uh, uh, decent one. So any, any thoughts? Yeah, that's the best thing. I forgot to add those points. Uh, mosquito repellents you, you definitely have to have for in, in India. Here, uh, not a problem, but in India, yes. I had terrible nights there, you know, spending uh, like beating mosquitoes instead of watching the stars. So that's one important thing. And also uh, farmhouses are great options. So you can just go to the terrace of the farmhouse and you can just spend your night without worrying about anything. And also you have a safety. There is one more thing that you have to take care in India you have to be aware of looters. There will be like people coming out, coming in and just taking all your, snatching all your equipment. And uh, you, end of the day, you just, you will lose everything that you have collected over the years. You know, it's hard earned money. So you have to have a companion for that, specifically for that, uh, to protect you from strangers snatching your stuff. Uh, I think it's a great, uh, it's, it's great to go to a farmhouse to get rid of all these things rather than spending a night yeah. in an unknown place. Yeah, true. And also, uh, I think it's especially in Indian settings, it's also very important to reach the spot before dusk. So like you reach there while it is still very much light so that you know the place. So I think that's also probably helped a lot. Okay, uh, I'll move on. Um, so I hope this, this helps uh, for the person who asked this question, but it's very relevant, actually. So let's move on to uh, the main question that people will have, right? How do uh, people begin with the hobby? Uh, what are the, some, of the, some, uh, some of the do's and don'ts for beginners? And what kind of gear should they go for? What should they first buy? Should they buy a binoculars or a telescope? These are evergreen questions. I'm sure everybody will have it uh, who's already starting off. So um, Avinash, do you want to take that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, okay, I think the first thing, I, I'll share my experience with it because it's a short uh, experience with my uh, beginning, beginning of astrophotography and today. So I can just share the fact that buy something which you're going to use. Uh, see, uh, you can always buy something, you know, if you have money, you can always buy a complicated mount, you know, or buy a heavy refractor or, you know, those uh, heavy Newtonians. But again, can you use it? Can you efficiently uh, make use of it? Can you, uh, given those hours which are required for that purchase, if you're not, then I would recommend you to not go ahead with it. So I think it's important to keep in mind the efficiency with which you are going to use the setup you buy. So if you know that you're stuck in a city and you don't want to invest in a lot of gear, then buy accordingly. Buy so, and then again, there are two, first of all, I forgot to mention that there are two domains, obviously, visual astronomy and, um, you know, your uh, astrophotography. And those two obviously deal with a little bit, the gears are different. Now, if you want to go with visual astronomy, many, many people recommend to start out, at least whether you are fascinated or not, with, it's good to start out with a binoc because it's an investment which can anyway be used otherwise for, you know, birding or any uh, uh, other uh, place you want to get that. You go uh, traveling, you can always carry a binoc with you. It's not only, you know, you can, you can use it anytime and it's portable. But if you ended up buying, uh, you know, uh, let's say for example, a six inch or eight inch dog, dog, then if you're not ready to go out to your terrace and, you know, invest that time, then maybe it won't be a good investment. So I think to realize that you, if you really can invest that much amount of time in your hobby, I think it's important to, 
so you're important to make a note of that and then purchase your equipment you know and the amount of time you can give in so like for me i wanted to start out astrophotography and i knew that I, i don't have a setup which is mobile i don't have a i don't own a car or uh, i can't move around so much so i wanted something which is portable which i can carry in my backpack and should not be weighing more than 10 to 12 kg so i went ahead with a setup which is more portable and uh, i can always carry around uh, with me and then set it up um so yeah i think the key thing to mind uh, to recommend the do's and don'ts is basically how well you can use it because there is a steep learning curve if you buy a costly setup so it's important to get used to the setup uh, you know by buying a slightly uh, less complicated uh, like a as i said a portable mount or a, a smaller refractor and then move forward you know and and invest more later on when you are into the hobby and you understand the ifs and buts like for example polar lining your your uh, you know uh, capturing all these lights dark flats you know your uh, balancing the mount or your dithering all those stuff if you understand them or guiding for that matter and then move forward you know once you have it in your backpack when you that that the knowledge then you can move forward for a co- uh, costlier setup and you know there's always scope for that so i would always suggest to start simple and then move up the ladder so that's my take on it yeah yeah i completely agree with what avinash said so don't use any equipment which you are not going to use and find the right equipment depending on your need so i'll share uh, my you know uh, like my story like how i started so most people will get an idea like how to, if you are planning to start so we'll have an idea i'll just split it in two if, if you have time uh, is it okay if i add more points yeah sure prabhu go ahead right so uh, you can split it into two one is for astrophotography and the other one is for astronomy and also uh, related to observational astronomy there are a lot of questions which uh, will be addressing in a while I'll, i'll cover a few more points in that as well so for astrophotography uh, one of the basic equipment that you can have is your mobile phone that's the you know the the basic thing that you can have and make sure that the mobile phone has some long exposure mode if not there are some apps which can you know let you crack that and you can take long exposure of it so just have a, you know, a tripod a small handy tripod just connect it and take long exposures of the night sky it not it's it, it not necessarily uh, be a constellation or anything just the night sky plain night sky once you know know how to capture how to take a shot uh image without any trails then you can move on you can just focus something you can have uh, a landscape you can just uh make a frame and you can capture milky way or you can do star trails by taking multiple images and software can make the star trails for you so that's the first thing and if you want to do serious uh, uh astrophotography and you can get a dslr so uh, uh, a basic dslr i'll just show mine this is my first uh, dslr it's a it's a crop sensor that's 700d canon from canon and uh, get a you will have a kit lens coming along with it most probably 18 to 55mm or 55 to 250mm lens and get a tripod and with this you will have uh, better images than uh, mobile cameras and you can do the same just uh, night scapes like taking the night sky images with the foreground and time lapses uh, star trails and milky way you can do all with this if you want to go further you can get a wide angle lens rather than a kit lens for example you know have a wide angle lens and the focal length of this is 12 mm it's like a fish eye it covers a lot of region in the sky and uh, this will make your image better and you can do plenty of things with it you can capture meteor shower you can capture many uh, you know wide angle related events so if you want to go further you can use a mid focal length lens like 50 mm or like 85 mm and you can take single images uh, so there is a thing called uh, you know 500 rule or 600 rule depending on the focal length and the size of the sensor you will have sharp stars so there is a, a duration for that so keep the exposure within the duration just take long exposure and you will have more images so take many many images and put all the things in the software and you will have a clean and neat image so this is for astrophotography and th- this is the cheapest and the simplest setup that you can have if you want to go a little further then you can uh, get a tracker like a, a a device with a rotating motor so i'll just share this is my first uh, sky tracker this is called star adventure from sky watcher so it just need to align just keep align this with the north celestial pole 
and then keep it on a tripod. Keep your camera lens here. It will track the motion of our Earth. So you can have the stars shop in the field of view and you can have more images you can stack and you can get amazing images. If you want to go further, you can uh, uh, get a, a, a bigger tracker if you want to add like big telescopes rather than a small camera under a DSL, uh, DSLR camera under lens, you can get uh, a bigger tracker, which are called equatorial mounts. And you can load a, a telescope and a camera and you can do a lot. Still, if you want to go further, if you want to capture amazing details of the nebulae and all, then you can modify your DSLR. So you can just rip off the infrared filter and that will be more. Uh, uh, so the sensor will be more sensitive towards that specific broadband and you can capture a lot of details. So still, if you want to go further, you can get a device uh, you know, which has a cooling, which has a cooler that will cool down the camera. So the noise of the image will go down so it can produce amazing results. So this is the, you know, uh, the step to take. That's how I do. So for observational astronomy, similarly, uh, you can uh, get, uh, first I would say start visually. You don't need an equipment to do astronomy. After all, our ancestors, they were doing just with, this, with, with their own naked eyes for like many hundreds and thousands of years. So uh, start visually, just learn the basics, understand the motion of the night sky, uh, orient yourself with the night sky and get to know the basics, the, the, just know the, uh, the name of the objects and uh, the properties of it. And then start with the binocular. So don't go for a telescope right away if you don't know how to use it, if you're a beginner. So you can get, you can go for a good uh, eight by 40 binocular. So whenever you see a binocular, you know, there are two numbers which comes. The first one is a digit. Most probably it will be a single or double digit. If it says eight, which means it's eight times magnification. So that's the magnification of the binocular. And the right side image, you will, uh, right side you will see two numbers like 40 or 50 or 60. That means that's the aperture size of the binocular. So if it is eight by 40, the size of the binocular is 40 and the magnification is eight. So eight by 40 is a good beginner binocular. And uh, with that, you can observe the night sky like some faint, uh, I'm sorry, some bright uh, deep sky objects, like bright clusters you can observe and you can watch moon and craters. But if you want to go, if you want to zoom in and you want to see the details of the planets, then you have to go for a telescope. So once you exploit the binocular, then you can move on to a telescope and the telescope size has to be uh, uh, anything above 70 or even uh, 80 millimeter. So don't go anything below that. There is this uh, uh, thing called so-called departmental store telescopes. So the most of the telescope that you see on Amazon or uh, any of the forums, you will see some cheap 50 mm telescope, 60 mm telescopes with mostly refractors. No, these are not very good if you want to start astronomy. And also there is a question who asked, what kills your interest uh, in astronomy? You know, what are the things that you should not do? Uh, I think, uh, Someone asked, yeah, what, what should I avoid while selecting a telescope? So like I said, don't go for too small and don't go for too big. If it is too big, if it is not portable, if it is not uh, compact, no, you're, going to, you're not going to use it. And uh, one important thing is exploit the available resource and then move on to the next. Your upgrade should be after completely exploiting the existing setup. So uh, then you're not justifying for the amount you have paid for your for your equipment. So that's one more thing. And uh, uh, regarding the observational astronomy, also you have to choose the type of the telescope as well. You know, some people want to see both planets and both galaxies. Uh, generally, you know, to see the planets, you need to have a telescope with a longer focal length. The native focal length should be longer, like. Uh, uh, schmidt cassegrains or Muxido, these are called uh, catadioptrics. Both has lens and mirror system. So this is good for planets. But if you want to observe both galaxies and, and planets, you can go for a Newtonian reflector. The most uh, famous and uh, uh, the, uh, the most uh, successful model is Dobsonian telescope. So Newton Dobsonian model, uh, it, it's, it, it's, it's small and it's not very compact, but you can get it for cheap. That's the primary uh, advantage of that. 
So you can get it for cheap. The aperture that you're paying is like, for for example, an eight-inch telescope, you can get it for some thirty-five to forty thousand Indian rupees. So uh, if you if you if you have a binocular, if you want to move forward, I would I would suggest you to go for an eight-inch telescope rather than going anything below that. If you have budget, if you don't have a budget, then you can go for one hundred and thirty millimeter, like five-inch or six-inch telescope, and then you can work your way out. And still, uh, if you want to go further, someone asked a question: What what should be my first telescope and what should be my second telescope? So you can increase the aperture by you can you can just uh, uh, you can just add number four with that. For example, if you're buying an eight inch, you can add number four with that, so it becomes twelve inch. So your second telescope should be twelve inch. And if you go for a ten inch telescope, the difference that you see from eight inch to ten inch is not great, but when you compare it with the 12 inch, you will see a lot of difference. So I jumped from a five inch straight to 16 inch because uh, in my previous company, I worked with uh, an eight inch telescope. I worked with that for two years. So um, I know what the capabilities and uh, what difference I would see. So then I skipped that and I straight away jumped like many numbers. So that's how you should choose your equipment accordingly. Great. Yep. Thanks, Prabhu. I think you did touch upon multiple things there, and uh, it did answer a bunch of questions we had. So I just want to check in the room if anybody has questions. I saw somebody raised a hand as well. So are there any questions related to what Prabhu just mentioned? Uh, if you have, feel free to unmute and ask the question. Sir, you can ask him to, uh, can he share whatever he uh, showed the equipments? Yeah, I can I can share that. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Deepti. Uh, I've been uh, I, I recently I got to know about BS through Twitter, and I'm really interested with all that that is happening here. So I have a 20 by 80 binoculars with me, and it's pretty good. I'm I'm happy with how it is working for me. I wanted to know if. Uh, you have any weekend getaways or groups where you, all of you get together and go out for nights watching or if there's a if there's anything of that format I would like to know about it all right so I'll try to answer that um, due to COVID um, these days I think we're not doing much of it we used to do more of that before but hopefully as things open up i think we'll do more of uh, again we'll start doing i think the best thing would be to uh, join the telegram group or be in touch with what's happening and we keep sharing updates in case there is something being planned that will be that will be shared so it's nothing that i'm aware of right now uh, if anybody else sudash or anyone else wants to add anything uh, please feel free yeah, uh, Deepthi, I'll answer the question once, uh, you know, uh, Prabhu has answered the other question, actually. Yes, sure. Right. So this is my equipment page. So uh, this this was my first telescope. I still have it. It's a 130 millimeter telescope. Uh, but I wouldn't recommend to get this telescope, you know, if you want to do astrophotography. Some people uh, want to buy a telescope to do both. Now, this, you cannot do astrophotography, like connecting a DSLR. It doesn't have enough inward focus. There is another thing that you have to keep in mind. And also, uh, uh, there is a question. Someone asked uh, that they cannot attain focus because of the because of this issue. So generally, observation telescopes uh, are meant for observational astronomy, not for astrophotography. So uh, the inward focus, uh, it doesn't have enough inward focus for the sensor to reach on the light cone. So uh, you have to push the mirror towards the secondary mirror or I mean the primary mirror towards the secondary mirror or you have to reduce the size of the telescope which I wouldn't recommend if you don't know how to do it. So this is a kind of that a similar telescope that uh, which doesn't have inward focus you have to do some modification to use it for astrophotography otherwise you can just do a focal photography by you know uh, keeping the mobile phone uh, on the top of the eyepiece or using some Barlow lens to get that inward focus outside so your sensor could reach it. So these are the other tricks that you can use, but you cannot uh, use it forever. So I wouldn't recommend if you want to get a telescope for both, so get something else which has enough inward focus. And uh, this is a, a refractor, which is an opochromatic refractor, 
for astrophotography. So this is my, uh, so I think, fourth telescope, which I use for deep sky astrophotography, mostly for nebulae. And this is a, a Ritchie Crating telescope. These are different, different types of telescopes. There are different types. So this is Ritchie Crating. And uh, this I generally use for smaller objects, such as galaxies, mostly for galaxies. And then uh, this is a, a, a filter. It's for sun, solar observation. It's a daystar quark chromosphere filter. You can see the hydrogen alpha wavelength through it, and you can see the prominence and chrominance. I, I also do observation and astrophotography with this. And this is the bigger tracker, which I was mentioning, an equatorial mount to load those big telescopes. And this is the small tracker, which I just showed, and my kit lens on the camera on a tripod. And these are uh, some observation observational telescopes, like. 90 millimeter and 80 millimeter. And if you have a, a binocular, you know, if you're not comfortable, if the binocular is heavy, if, if it is, uh, if you're not comfortable holding it for a longer time, you know, you will get uh, uh, some strain on your neck. So you can use a palogram like this. You can make it yourself. It's easy to make, just need uh, the design and you can just get it made from your carpenter. I made this for very, very cheap. I made this for about 800 rupees. Uh, just need a tripod and uh, just need a design, you can mount it and it is very easy to use. You will see amazing difference when you use a parallelogram. So in observation, comfort is more important. So when you don't strain your muscles, you know, you'll see more details. So these are uh, some of the other combinations which I use with different, different cameras and different, different things. But generally, uh, I use the uh, refractor and then the Ritchie Crating and this uh, 16 inch for uh, planetary astrophotography and observation. Okay, all right. Let me address the uh, question that uh, no, Deepthi asked. <clears throat> okay, so uh, Deepthi, we uh, uh, conduct, uh, you know, uh, uh, star parties specifically for this particular reason of, you know, uh, introducing uh, uh, you know, beginners and intermediary as well as uh, you know astrophotographers to dark locations so uh, basically one of the you know agenda of uh, you know bangalore astronomical society is uh, having star parties but usually in the winter season uh, the winter normally you know spreads across october to you know march april uh, depending on you know when the season breaks sometimes there is rain sometimes there is actually you know cloudy uh, you know uh, so uh, we usually take, uh, you know, uh, people, uh, usually we post it in, uh, you know, Telegram and Google groups earlier in WhatsApp. So uh, <clears throat> there are, uh, you know, uh, uh, visual astronomers and astrophotographers uh, who actually come to the location. Uh, even if, uh, you know, if you don't have an instrument, you can always come and, uh, you know, uh, enjoy the night skies. So the model of operation is that uh, we know we'll post it in about uh, in the group in about two to three weeks in advance. Uh, whenever we feel that you know during a new moon that uh, you know cloudless uh, you know uh, skies are possible, and then we ask for you know registration to actually happen. So these are all actually you know non-profit arrangements. Uh, you know we don't take uh, you know any money out of it. All. So uh, usually the cost is actually you know uh, shared across uh, you know people. Uh, usually the dark locations do not have, you know, very sophisticated accommodations and all that. So adjust with actually whatever is available. And, uh, you know, uh, because it is a non-profit, everybody does, you know, their own bit of, you know, volunteering to, you know, do. So uh, in those dark locations, uh, we have, uh, you know, some arrangement for, uh, you know, uh, staying and uh, boarding and lodging is available. So uh, uh, safety is you know particularly ensured uh, where you know uh, the location where we go in uh, most likely a resort or you know, uh, a location where we go uh, it is uh, probably something like a, you know a bounded uh, you know uh, some place where uh, we usually go and then uh, you know uh, you get to experience uh, the you know uh, clear nights uh, also you know visually astrophotographically interact with uh, you know. Uh, people at uh, different stages of the hobby. Some people have been capturing images for you know 15 years, so you get to interact with them. 
somebody has just actually started with uh, you know an equatorial mount actually we get to start uh, you know with them somebody is having only a tripod and uh, a small gorilla tripod and a dslr trying to capture actually uh, you know a star trail so you get to interact with all these kind of people you also get to interact with the visual observers actually who have uh, you know uh, uh, if uh, you know uh, <clears throat> things go well uh, maybe a 17.5 inch telescope also may come uh, you know but most likely you know a lot of 8 inch uh, you know dobsonian uh, telescopes and uh, 10 inch dobsonian telescopes will definitely come of course a lot of uh, you know interesting people you get to meet and uh, you know uh, we usually stay there for about 2 3 nights uh, you know <clears throat> uh, so that you get to understand the you know night sky and usually in the night the format will be that uh, you know experienced uh, you know volunteers will introduce the night sky to people uh Uh, saying that this is this constellation what you see in the uh, this is this star this is that star etc and then you get to observe whenever you know people start observing they will say okay now uh, i mean i am focusing on m45 do you want to see it so somebody will be asking question on you know what is m45 so people will be answering so that is how you get to learn this sky so uh, that is one of the you know interesting programs that we used to conduct because of covid it has been actually restrictive in nature actually these last one or two years but hopefully you know uh, from uh, uh, november onwards if the sky breaks actually and uh, uh, things are okay we should be able to you know uh, uh, arrange for uh, star parties actually this season and uh, let us hope so that it gets done <clears throat> deepi for your particular you know uh, binocular that you have 2080 you cannot do handheld uh, you know so you need you definitely yeah, yeah. i have drive. a tripod also with it it's impossible it weighs 2 kg so i have to mount it on a tripod and then look at yeah, it yeah and uh, you are not a normal dslr tripod you definitely need a tripod yes, which yes, will probably yes. hold more than probably you know 18 yes, yes, kg yes, yes, or so yes. the maximum is about 7 kg for my tripod so it's okay, so usually well we suggest a, yeah usually we suggest a vanguard or a manfrotto yeah. all this kind of okay all right so i suppose that answers your uh, this question as well also many other questions on you know how to introduce actually you know dark skies to beginners and where do you go and actually look for it you go drive your car actually you know go suddenly park in monday and then open your binoculars and see only to be robbed by somebody actually so so uh, this is where you know uh, bas kind of you know volunteering organization actually comes into uh, you know uh, picture we are happy to do that in fact all of our volunteers actually are very happy actually doing those and outreach program Okay then. Uh, so uh, Satish, over to you. Hey, thanks, Dash. Okay, yeah, and these star parties are um, a very interesting um, time. So yeah, definitely join us when we do them. One good thing you also uh, come across is uh, all the equipments that uh, people have, and they are always willing to share. Uh, that is something unique about this group. So. hopefully we'll do some sessions and we can get to see each other in person as well okay so i just uh, want to highlight one thing uh, i should yeah. mention this i've mentioned it in many groups the bangalore astronomical society is one of the most active groups in the world and uh, the uh, the volunteers they have a tremendous amount of knowledge and equipment and you just join the group you will learn everything so I, it's it's great to be a part of bangalore astronomical society that's great uh, prabhu thanks for mentioning that that means a lot uh, it it really gives us a perspective when people from outside actually join the group and then they can compare and they say hey you guys are actually doing at a certain level so that's awesome and i think it kudos to all the uh, uh, volunteers uh, you know and there are people who have been doing this for a long long time in the group and who created the platform so you know uh, so kudos to all of them okay um all right i did want to segue into astrophotography a little bit and uh, we have discussed um some concepts we have discussed equipments and do's and don'ts um i did have some specific questions on astrophotography now i myself i am not into photography at all so i'm going to ask pretty basic questions so uh there you go so firstly when you guys do astrophotography right and for anybody who's starting what are the different stages involved i know um you capture a lot of raw data and then you um do some things 
on your with your scope or the device that you're using then you take that back and then you use softwares uh, probably there are multiple stages in which you refine and bring those images together and finally you create frames and you create so all these jargons are there so if can we get an idea of what is the life cycle from the time you uh, take something till the time you have a polished um, image okay <clears throat> so yeah i'm not sure to go ahead yep. yeah sure um, so to start out like with a, a basic of you know um at the night at your uh, you know dark sky so the first thing i do is obviously take out my tripod balance so you have these uh, you know i draw the water level indicators so i basically align it so that it's flat level uh, because i currently own a tracker and i want the tracker to function as per my needs uh, for my telephoto focal length so first thing is first i balance out my leg. So the level the tripod then put on my tracker okay second thing is obviously immediately after that you have to align polar align so you take out the uh, you know those caps which are coming on your tracker and polar align so as we all know that we the earth spins around its axis you know it's just kind of uh, uh, 23 and a half degrees tilted uh, so we we have to align our tracker in a way that we are matching the rotation of the earth see the sky is not really moving I means there are stars which have proper motions but what is moving in fact at the rate we are talking about is the earth so we have to polar align and polar is is the closest we have to the pole star in the north pole it's not exactly at the north pole but it's close to the north pole so we have to polar align so we place the polar is at an appropriate distance and an appropriate time and for these we use these uh, you know as prabhu had earlier mentioned these mobile apps which actually shows you the current position of polar is so you can uh, put uh you know align polar align and put the polaris and on uh, on the dedicated location where it should be you know it says i think polaris is around 36 arc minutes offset from the north celestial pole so yeah so that's the first so you level the tripod then you uh, polar align then you mount your uh, and actually this was uh, after mount uh, the scope has already been mounted because i don't want the weight changes to in uh, you know alter my polar alignment so the, the setup was already mounted now the thing is i have to balance uh so I currently own a two-inch refractor, the 51 mm uh, William Optics uh, f4.9 f4. uh, refractor. So it's a decent bit heavy, you know. Along with my DSLR, I think it weighs around total of 2.4 kg. So I use this counterweight uh, to balance out. So I check my balancing, uh, check the balancing on my uh, tracker, and then I I, I I align my setup to a bright star. So look for focusing. So these uh, William Optics ones comes with a battery mask, and our battery masks are wonderful for focusing. So, well, you can always focus using a bright star and try to minimize it to a point source as possible. But sometimes I feel that you can always miss it. That you know that slightest by a slightest angle, your image will be slightly out of focus. So a battery mask helps you achieve those you know pinpoint focus. So I use a battery mask, focus on a bright star, uh, you know, in the region where I want to probably. Uh, you know, uh, uh, image, and then I relocate and then point my telescope because I don't have a go-to, so I have to do this manual relocation, which can, which generally takes the most amount of time. To be honest, the other steps will probably be finished in maybe less than ten minutes. But relocating sometimes when you don't have a, a, a go-to uh, setup can be time-taking. So you know, you use these bright stars. So understanding the sky, you know, understanding where these constellations are, understanding where these bright stars near those nebulas and galaxies you want to image is uh, comes in handy sometimes and sometimes you're new to it so you just use these celerium apps you know okay i understand okay so these are the bright stars nearby so i hook i go frame by frame and try to align my object in those in my field of view and uh, sometimes you have to you know uh, rotate your field of view to accommodate for example uh, in, in my uh, 51 mm uh, refractor uh, and um, and the crop uh, field of view because of my crop sensor I can barely just fit in the horse set, the flame, and the Orion and the running man. So for that, I need a particular alignment. If I'm off, then I won't. So I have to rotate. You can. Uh, some, fortunately, the refractor comes with a you know rotator. You can just rotate your camera, uh, which is mounted on there, and then you know so you have it. You have it good to go. And based on your polar alignment, test your exposure. So I would test it at, for example, if I want to take a one-minute exposure. Initially, I didn't have an intervalometer, so I could maximum do thirty seconds. So 
So I used to just, you know, basically run it at 30 seconds, test it, whether it is not trailing. So I know for sure that I am not having any uh, polar element issues. And then once I've tested it uh, and tested using your uh, built-in intervalometer, don't use your click because sometimes the clicks can also cause trails. You know, when you're pressing the button physically and, you know, that can lead to trails in the image, but it'll be in the first few seconds. It shakes for a few seconds before it actually becomes normal. So I start the intervalometer with a delay in the camera itself. Uh, and then, and if you have an interval in an external intervalometer, that's the best way. Uh, and give it time uh, based on the limit of how long you can track. So for telephoto focal lengths, it'll be much lesser. I'm sure you won't be wanting to go more than a minute or two without an auto guided setup. Uh, so I have done max two minutes without having any trailing issues, but that's with precise polar alignment and checking my exposures again and again. So this is basically in the field. Now I just set it up and then leave. And maybe an after an hour or two, I keep checking it because I want to be sure whether my battery has not drained or, you know, uh, maybe there was not a wind gust which shook my tripod. So I just switch off the timer and check the framing was all right. The exposures were not trailing and everything. And then I come back again. So I just check these uh, on an hourly basis sometimes. Uh, and then uh, yeah, take your images to computer. And that's the reason why we, so now the reason why we take so many images is because you want to minimize the noise. My camera does not have a, cooling solution. So I will have a lot of thermal noise going in into my image. So, um, and I've been fortunate enough to live in a slightly colder place. So uh, that kind of minimizes or helps in uh, not having a lot of thermal noise, but still there will be a lot of thermal noise uh, because the camera is still heated up uh, because I've been receiving photons every other exposure and having a delay of just one second. So uh, I think capturing sometimes calibration frames is important. So you should immediately after you're done, uh, which I didn't do initially for my first uh, few months. I didn't pay so much importance to those uh, because I didn't see a lot of difference. But actually, it does pay a lot of difference if you uh, if you if you go one up in your processing. If your processing skills are a little bit limited, you won't see the differences. But as you as soon as you go up, you realize the importance of calibration frames more often. So um, removing gradients and all. So in capturing flats is very important. Uh, capturing your darks, which is even though you are in a cold place. You're not cooled at minus 60. It's not that cold. So you have to, uh, you, there will be thermal noise. So it's important to take those frames. And uh, so that will help you in your uh, uh, post-processing. So capturing all the lights, uh, which are your nebulae or galaxy images or your flats or darks are very essential. Take them to your processing software. And I think uh, as much as the first part, which I just explained is important, post-processing and astrophotography is equally important. I think, um, that will change the game. Data is one part, but have, uh, I think uh, learning new techniques, whether it's your Photoshop, Pix Insight, any software you choose, I think the techniques uh, you learn and um, you better at will actually make your images go to the next level. I think that was, that probably changed. Like I have a few images which I processed late back in December and then certain images processed, processed in May or June. It's the same data, but the level of uh, the techniques I learned in, in, the, you know, in the last few months have helped me actually get more out of the images. So there is data, but do I know how to get it out? Do I know how to bring it out? The so stretching the data and how to stretch it that you don't blow up the cores of the galaxies or blow up the bright stars in your images, all that, you know, learning techniques or masking, all that helps, uh, you know, in your workflow. So the first part is obviously data capturing and keeping all those steps in mind. And second is processing. And it's not important which software you use. It's more important to learn all those techniques which are important um, for a software. So if you want to stay in the Photoshop ecosystem, learn all those uh, you know level stretching curves uh, adjustment. You you need to you curve stretching levels. You need to know all that stuff to actually take your images to the next level. Yeah. So that's all I have. Uh, maybe Prabhu can take over. Yeah. Yeah, Prabhu. Do you want to add any any any? specific techniques that you follow any um uh, so, uh, yeah i think uh, uh, avinash pretty much covered everything and he, he explained very well in detail and also i should mention that uh, you know there are very few people who get the best out of their equipment uh, particularly a basic level equipment in the recent times avinash is one good example the amount of uh, details and the picture quality that he has with his equipment is great. I've never seen you know, anyone doing like that in India. I've seen in other countries, but uh, you no. Know, when I was in that level, when I was using the tracker and I couldn't achieve uh, this kind of level. I thought maybe I have to buy uh, better equipment to get uh, quality like that. 
but now uh, it's completely different you know i would have stayed in that equipment if i had if i had known that so uh, besides that i want to touch a few things on uh, you know uh, on certain things when you have an equipment like a bigger equatorial mount so he covered all the basic details he covered everything uh, if if you have a big equatorial mount you know just by looking at the reticule of the polar scope and finding the, keeping the polar is there is not enough to get uh, uh, long exposures so you still you will have some trails because of a lot of imperfections in the mount and many other things many other factors so uh, there is one more thing to to get accurate polar element and also there are questions related to that as well so i'll cover that later uh, so what i do is after keeping the telescope uh, for example my big 8 uh, inch telescope and the cameras and everything so i take images uh, there are some soft there are some cameras specifically for that polar element but i use the uh, main imaging camera as a polar camera so the idea is to take one image Uh, at the home position, pointing towards uh, the due north celestial pole, and just rotate the right ascension that uh, telescope to 90 degree, and then take another image and compare. The software will compare the image, and it will give you how off it is from the north celestial pole. Because from here to here, you will have an arc, and that the software will know uh, what exactly it should be. So it will give you the details how off it is. Then you have to adjust the mount. accordingly and it takes very less time just like you can finish it off in a minute or so and you will be perfectly aligned and then you can take long exposure images but still you know some equipment some uh, some trackers are not uh, uh, high end equipment which cannot take longer exposure like say 5 minutes with a higher focal length the shorter the focal length the longer the exposure can be but the higher the focal length now you will struggle to get round stars so you need to add one more thing on the top which is called a guide scope this is like another telescope another camera but that will tell the mount where the stars are moving for example if the star is not moving where it's supposed to move let's say from east to west if it is slightly moving in another way uh, either on both the sides then the camera will send the information to the mount through the laptop through a device and it will correct that discrepancies so in that way if it is moving there it will tell this is not the right direction you are supposed to be there then it will move and it will keep that position and this is called guiding it's like guiding the main mount by looking at the picture of another camera it's simple as that then you will have longer exposure with the guide scope you can extend it for 5 minutes you can extend for 10 minutes even 30 minutes you can depending on the bottle scale and depending on the uh, brightness of the object and then uh, there is uh, apart from capturing all those things also calibration frames are very important uh, particularly darks and flats uh, with the dslr you need also bias but these are the calibration frames which makes the image better to keep it simple so uh, flats will uh, solve the vignetting issues when you stretch an image you will have like black tints in the corners that's called vignetting and that will be eliminated if you take flats and also there will be some dust in the light cone uh, so you will have some donuts like dark patches in the middle of the images when you stretch so they those will be also eliminated with flats and taking flats is very important and also when you take flats you should you should not change the position of the imaging tray be it be it the uh, camera be it uh, the the filters if you are using you should not change anything just take flats with the light panel in the front as it is and you can easily calibrate calibrate it out during post processing so yeah i think pretty much uh, he covered rest of the things so that's it right so i want to go to a, a little different object so how about imaging something like iss have you guys ever tried it and um, how does thing how do things change when there is a fast moving object okay so for the yeah avinash you, if you want to yeah i was just going to say that i've never tried it <laughs> so yeah i think prabhu would be the better person to answer this yeah okay so yeah i tried uh, international space station probably some four five times so uh, there are some people who are taking amazing pictures with the uh, telephoto lens as well like the 600 mm uh, bird photography lens so 
ice is pretty small and uh, you know depending on the depending on the distance ice's size also changes its apparent size also changes so you need to uh, find the uh, apparent size should be biggest so make sure that it is biggest and also it is lasting longer and the position is higher not very close to the horizon most often you will see transit of ice happens very next to the horizon and you will have if you have uh, a transit let's say today next day also you will have and the next to next day also you will have so you will have this window for 3 years 3, three days and then after that ice ice will go the other side so you will you, you will not have this window again so you will have 3 to 4 days windows if you have ices in any time of the week so you can use that and you can find uh, some apps you that will show you the magnitude which is the brightness of the object it should be above minus 3 if, if it is above minus 2 minus 3 it'll be great and also if it is high up in the sky it'll be great so if you have an equipment like a uh, uh, like a telephoto lens you can just take fast images like in burst mode like how boat photographers do just take like chuck 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 you will get some uh, sharp images if you have a telescope if you want to take an image or video of that so the best thing is to take a video not an image if you use it through a telescope just take a video and then stack it this there is a process called uh, 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 lucky imaging lucky imaging this is like stacking all the video frames into one you will get a clean and completed image so you can do that process if you have a, a, a telescope just attach a camera through it and take a video so i have uh, tried uh, many times i've uh, captured few images successfully as well if you want i can i can show it and there are uh, uh, some difficulties capturing it. Just a sec. Can, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. So the thing is, ISS moves very fast. Uh, it uh, like it makes a transit in less than five minutes. So you have to track it very well. And there are some uh, equatorial mounds where you can add your own code and you can track it. You can match the speed of the ISS. You can track it very well. But most of the you know, low end mounds uh, doesn't have that capability. So you have to track it manually. Just a sec. Oh, here it is. So if you don't have anything, so this is how I used to take with just a camera and a DSLR, like a, a wide angle kit lens, just taking a trails of ISS. Just take images like every five seconds and you make a star trail. So you will have, similarly you have ISS trail. And then if you have a big telescope and if you have a, like a, a planetary camera, so you can just attach it and you can, you can align the finder scope and you can attach the camera and you can just only look at the finder scope in the crosshair all you have to do is in the transit period, you just have to keep ISS right at the center of the crosshair. And don't look at the screen, don't look elsewhere, just look at the crosshair and try your best to keep it right at the center. Some people might find it difficult to track it. You will have uh, some back pain when you're doing it for five minutes. So what I, what, what I normally do is, particularly with my 16 inch, because it's very difficult to move it around. So I just overshoot it. I just predict the movement and overshoot it like few degrees and I wait for the ISS to cross. In the moment that it crosses, since my frames per second of the video is more, so it captures like 100 uh, frames in that fraction of a second. So I just add all the images to get a sharpest view. So that's how I made this by uh, tracking it manually and then cutting all the videos into fraction fraction of seconds because like an airplane approaches you, you will see the front end and when it crosses you, above you, you will see the belly and then you will see the back end. Likewise, you will have the tilt as well. So when, approach, when, when, when when ISS rises, you will see the front and then when it goes above you, you will see the bottom. Likewise, you will have a shift. So you have to, you cannot stack all the videos together in one transit. You have to cut it down and make sure that transit is not happening. And then you can stack the individual frames and you can get a sharp view of each faces. Then you will, among that each phase, you will have one sharp image like this, and you can use that. So that's how we do it, which is not uh, very difficult. You can do it. Awesome. That is really cool. <laughs> that's really cool. So, um, and that brings to, you know, I did want to, uh, uh, you know, ask you if you, if you both want to show us 
your favorite objects that you have imaged. But before that, just wanted to check if there are any questions from the room. Anybody or, or from YouTube? Yeah, hi, hi, this is Sandeep here. I have one, so I have one question. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I understand that um, we, we cannot use same gear for uh, uh, for both astrophotography and uh, and visual astronomy for a, uh, so let's say to photograph a nebula or a, a, of that of that sort. So, is there a balance in between? So, can we choose an equipment where uh, 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 I would not say um, hundred percent visual and hundred percent astrophotography, but is there a balance in between? Is there an equipment we can choose where you can balance in between, where you can use for both, but not, uh, uh, I mean, not completely? Yes, yes, definitely. There are uh, plenty of equipment where you can uh, do both. Uh, so you have to buy an astrophotography telescope or a telescope which has enough inward focus for the IPs and also for the sensor to reach. So generally, most of the telescopes has, like I said in my earlier explanation, that most of the observation telescopes doesn't have enough uh, inward focus, sorry, output focus for the sensor to reach. For example, if this is the light cone, you, know, you can put the eyepiece here and you can still get that focusing point within that eyepiece and you can do it for observation. Whereas a sensor is here. When you put the adapter like T-ring and T-adapter, that's the stop point. You cannot go further. So to get it further, you can add an, uh, a bar low that will bring it back. Otherwise you have to push this mirror towards the secondary mirror. So that pushes the light cone, a focusing point towards the sensor and you can reach it. Or you have to shorten the focuser. That focuser element itself is, it has some 20 to 30 uh, millimeters. That if you reduce it, then you can get the mirror closer to it. Otherwise you get a, uh, an observation telescope, I mean, astrophotography telescope and that has enough uh, backward focus. And when you put the eyepiece, then you may not be able to focus it because it has so the focusing point has gone too far behind the focuser. So in that case, you add an extender, tele-extender, like an adapter, and put the eyepiece. So now you can keep the DSLR and the eyepiece at the same position, and you can use it for both observation and astrophotography as well. So most of the astrophotography telescopes has this option, has this extender, and you can do both. And to do both, you need to have a tracking mount, not typical alt azimuth mount, which moves in up and down, left and right axis. So that will give you field rotation. Like if moon is rising and setting, when it tracks in this position, you will have the moon uh, rotating in the field, like from left to right. So this field rotation, because of this, you'll be restricted to do long exposure images of deep sky objects. So we can only uh, do planetary imaging with this kind of alt azimuth mount. So, you have to have an equatorial mount so you can do both observation and astrophotography without any issues. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I get it. So another quick question. So uh, when we speak about astrophotography, um, uh, we speak about flats, lights, and uh, could you just explain a little more about what these mean? So I'm very new to uh, astronomy. I would I read somewhere, but I was not able to get a clear info as to what these mean. So, so I, I, I see there are four parameters, right? You just mentioned about flats, lights, and uh, actual images are, uh, of that sort. So what does this mean? Uh, uh, each, um, each term means here. Yeah. Um, so that's a very good question for a beginner starting out. Uh, so let's, let me start with, uh, you know, your lights. So lights are basically your images of what you're capturing in the sky. So you, whether it be a nebula or a galaxy or any other deep star object, or any other object for that matter. So basically, that those are the images where you keep your shutter, uh, your camera a lens cap off, or your telescope open, and then you observe. So basically, those are just simple your uh, images. Now coming to bias, that's the next um, aspect which comes in your imaging. Now bias is basically, you know, the counts which are there in your sensor. If you do not expose your uh, camera, for example, if you close the lens cap, take a take the fastest shutter speed possible, you know, even then you will find counts in your uh, images. Now, what is that? You're not observing anything. Your lens cap is closed. There's no ambient light. What, what can it be? So because there is a uh, bias voltage applied to your detector, 
there will always be some uh, you know bias counts and this doesn't happen only for your astrophotography but even if you come to professional astronomy all ccds will always have a by default uh, bias count so we we need to do this subtraction before we move forward with our processing of the data so it's always important to remove this bias so bias is basically subtracted so you can take your light subtract the bias directly and generally what we end up doing is we take multiple biases and take an average of them so that there is no variation uh you know uh, and then we subtract from the light images so let's say you observe 10 dark 10 biases take the uh, median of them or mean median and then subtract it from your light images and all of them and then only you can stack the images but before that there is another step um, now when we talk about dark there is another another thing which falls in a similar line called dark now dark generally happen because of your thermal noise creep creeping in a sensor now when it comes to uh, dslrs and you know your uh, uh, any other point and shoot cameras for that matter you are shooting at the ambient temperature of the location you are not cooling a camera or doing anything like that so there will be ambient thermal noise which will accumulate over the exposure duration so if your exposures are longer you will have much more and more dark noise in your images and that is um, over and above your image so for example if you are observing let's say uh, you know the orion nebula you will have dark counts as well uh and the longer the exposures you will have this so you need to subtract these so again we take multiple dark images average them out and subtract them now these images are generally not so important in for example professional astronomy because people cool their cameras like we observe from sct so we cool this using ln2 a liquid nitrogen cooling we don't have to worry so much about darks because there is no thermal noise as per se the detector is cooled to you know minus 196 degrees so there's no ambient thermal noise even if you take 2 3 minute exposure there's no thermal noise whereas in a dslr there will be a lot of thermal noise now and i'm coming back to flash so those two are subtracted you have to subtract your dots have to subtract your biases now flash now flash are these uh, as prabhu already mentioned uh, correcting your vignetting pattern um, you know the 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 light cone which is generated by your optics is not always going to be you know larger than your sensor so they it can be slightly smaller and what that leads to is vignetting at the edges and not only that when you have dust patches on your sensors or you know they create these funny dust bunnies on your uh, images which you can't really remove uh, if you think about it in processing because um they will just accumulate and also they will form pattern if you're uh, for example your images are having drift they will form a pattern which is drifting along so that dust bunny will basically move across the images and it's very difficult to remove like i've tried it uh, maybe i'm not competent enough to remove it in post processing but it's a pain so to it's better to handle this beforehand uh by taking flat so you take a flat white image and i'm taking really flat image so basically a white image which has uniform response and as uh, we already mentioned do not change your settings do not change your uh, but you have to change your exposure time because these are will be very bright so the only setting you change is your exposure time to basically keep your histogram in the middle of the uh, you know so you do not do not saturate your uh, image or do not under expose your flash so just change it for time to match you know your uh, uh, to keep the histogram in the middle and observe these and again take a bunch of them average it out and then divide it from your original image which is the light so light after being subtracted from your biases and dark will be divided by the flash and by the way flash also are subtracted by, by your uh, biases flash uh, will indeed contain your bias counts as well because that is just default counts present in your detector uh because of the bias voltage so so flats subtracted by bias would be again divide uh, divided by the light which are already subtracted from the dark and biases so you remember this that these are important to have just the data with you and remove all the artifacts uh, arising due to the camera sensor uh, voltages or you know your uh, uh, vignetting patterns or your dust bunnies and all that stuff so to remove all these we take all these three types of calibration frames uh i hope that answers your question yeah yeah thank you thank you so much and uh, uh, so so uh, uh, is there a ratio uh, do we choose let's say uh, x number of lights and y number of darks and so so is there a ratio or a thumb rule kind of uh, uh, rule here or it is just by uh, visually you have to assess yeah uh, so this has to be done or this has to be done um uh, to be honest i i have not come across this because like for example in professional some i have used a lot of these frames but i have never really heard of uh, an important ratio in mind just remember that you take enough so that you average out you know the variations between the frames sometimes what can happen is you get a bad flat or a bad bias frame 
so we just take enough frames like you know um, uh, so that you don't have these effects of the individual frames on your final light image you don't want the artifacts which can be present in these you know maybe because the shutter closed improperly or something happened uh, and those artifacts to reflect in your final image so you just take enough Im images so that you can average them out so i think uh, like because uh, averaging out goes with your uh, you know the more root over your number of frames taken so you should take at least 10 maybe so you can minimize these uh, you know artifacts which can come if you have you know uh, let's say one false frame so if you take 10 images you would be good to go i think that should be a safe number i think that that's that's all i have i don't think there is anything uh, any safe number for that matter yeah okay thank you thank you mr avinash and kumar and prabhu great good questions sandeep uh, you did cover some of the points i had so that was good um any other questions from the room uh, satish we may go ahead with uh, the you know uh, questions which were asked uh, by the participant uh, who had registered before actually uh, yes we have gone through some of it some of it is remaining um i will quickly come to that i was thinking should we uh, quickly also see uh, the images and videos um and then or we can do the other way also we, so we are running uh, short uh, yeah we are running, yes, we are of running short of time that's true so i think we covered some of it already um there was one so or two questions that are i not covered we can actually yeah we, whichever questions are not covered we can start them now so here is one uh, we are planning to make a rooftop sky gazing observatory area for our apartment society so can you help with some suggestions so um probably you want to take a stab at uh, yeah rooftop observatory right like the role of observatory i presume the rooftop so there's uh, some people who want to create a rooftop sky observatory right. in their society right right so if uh, they're planning for that i would suggest a role of observatory instead of a dome because if you have a dome you, if you have multiple equipment then you need to have a bigger dome that will increase the cost exponentially and you need a proper planning for to do that so uh, i tried doing that when i was in india so i know some part of it so role of roof observatory is pretty simple just uh, build a wall or uh, anything if you have uh, your terrace and you 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 would already have a wall around it so at least some to some like let's say uh, one and a half meters or something from the flat ground level so then extend it to something around 6 uh, feet or so and then you can have a, a roll off mechanism you can just add some wheels and some uh, wooden sheet or any other uh, better form of sheets and just roll it down and roll it up so when you are doing the observations just roll it down and you can have all your equipment and you can do the observation and once it is done just cover it by rolling it back again and make sure that you you secure all the uh, exit points if it is rains make sure the water is not coming in if it is windy make sure the sand is not coming in so those kind of things you can do also you can automate it as well so you can uh, just connect the motors to your computer if you have uh, like high end equipment if you want to do remote imaging you can also access everything from a different place so i'm in future i'm planning to do that I'm planning to install my equipment in a remote place here so uh, if, for for a uh, roof observatory roll off is a is the best option if you have multiple equipment or if you want to dedicate it only for one equipment then uh, dome is the best option yeah and i feel just just to add to that uh, the thought that came to me was apart from what you said um uh, prabhu since uh, it's a rooftop i you know the exit points that you mentioned uh, sealing them off for me i think that's also a very important point because sometimes when you are on the roof after a point you may just forget that you are on the roof especially if you have kids uh, so that's one thing i want to i would suggest make sure you are sealing off the exit points and uh, you know where the open areas are so yeah thanks for that um also quickly getting into another question which was around career so how to pursue a career in astronomy after btech computer science and i want to have a fairly detailed answer uh, is what the question is i think it's by jebin i am i don't know jebin if you are there otherwise yeah probably uh, if you want to take that um yeah we know okay. sure. uh, i'll go ahead yeah okay um that's a very good question for somebody who is moving out of engineering uh, 
So I, I'm, I'm presuming you have already completed your uh, B Tech. I know I'll, I'll I'll give a caveat if you have not. Um, so I think the first thing to keep in mind and getting acquainted with all the physics courses because if you want to apply and uh, do a PhD in astronomy, you have to have a back end of physics. You know, and it's very essential when you join any astronomy course. There will be a lot of uh, what I should say an a priori physics knowledge um, kind of assumed that you have before you enter those courses. So. That is something which I faced, uh, and it was difficult initially. But I think it's important that you give enough time to reading up uh, a lot of these physics textbooks, which come for B, uh, BSc and MSc, um, because engineering courses, especially your yours was, uh, as I said, computer science, do not have those physics courses, and they, and even if those one or two courses which are there in our engineering degrees are not in depth. So I think an important step would be to first acquaint yourself with you know the basic physics uh, subjects you know like quantum mechanics or uh, statistical mechanics your uh, classical mechanics and in special cases you can take some specializations if you want to do some gr cosmology study and all that so but that's not needed but what is more important is understanding the basic physics courses and that will help you you know appear for any exams because the only way you can actually go for a phd is through an examination uh, and then followed by an interview so what I did was uh, after my BTEC in uh, electronics and communication, I dropped off because uh, I needed some time to prepare. And I took some online courses on Coursera and edX for astronomy uh, so that, you know, I'm acquainted towards certain things. Um, and then for the physics part, I actually read up. So it's important to read up those uh, books, which are an essential part of the curriculum. So that these will be essential in an examination. So there are various examinations nowadays the most the two most prominent are the gate physics and jest physics so joint entrance screening test in physics uh, and then you have uh, you know ia conducting their own tests you have uh, tf are conducting their own tests um, and many of them many other universities uh, like uh, isc or iscr they all call people based on the examination results of these uh, two global tests like the tf sorry the jest and the gate so yeah it's important to read up um, make a uh, have a good knowledge base, uh, write these exams, then there'll be a short list. You will have to appear for those interviews. And then based on what you feel is the right place to go. So that, and now what do you mean by that? You might ask, because now it's important to understand what you want to do in astrophysics. Do you want to do observational astronomy? Do you want to do theoretical? Do you want to do astronomical instrumentation? So there are a lot of domains and those are very broad domains. I mean, like for example, I work in Google as supernovae, but let's say for example, you want to work on interaction of galaxies or you want to work on simulating these galaxies uh, interactions so there are a lot of domains you can work on and based on that there are a lot of faculties around in india for example and i'm speaking mostly in indian terminology you can always go and apply abroad but most of them generally would look for a you know a publication or a small project which you have already done if you haven't it's good to always approach somebody uh, and nowadays because of so many visiting students uh, research programs and like for example in ia or uh, you have all of them you can go for and do a three months project or a six months project based on their uh, based on the university and gain experience, which is going to be essential in applying for these uh, positions abroad. But uh, in all, you have to first keep in mind that you have to prepare your knowledge base. It's important to have that because it's going to be more difficult when you write those exams and appear for the interview, especially, you know. And then when you enter the coursework, um, again, facing the those 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 that the reading up you did will come in handy because they will require a minimum knowledge which is not given in engineering but which you would have acquired through your reading up and then choosing your supervisor which is again a matter of what your interest lies in and there are a lot of domains you have theoretical simulation uh, instrumentation you know all kinds of stuff and choose your guide on your you know uh, institute accordingly so yeah keep all these aspects in mind and obviously you are free to uh, ping me anytime in future i think uh, we are all there on bas group and if you have any suggestions or any questions you can always uh, ping us later and about any specific questions you might have regarding career parts so yeah uh, i think that's all from my side yeah cool thanks avanesh okay um uh, uh probably if, did you want to add anything or should i uh, go on to the next one i think he pretty much covered everything all right cool so um some of the other questions remaining were on the books. So what are the, some of the good books that people can uh, read? 
while they are getting started on astronomy or astrophysics so on this one actually we will probably share a separate list and share uh, you know we'll compile a list and share in the group but anything that you want to mention right now prabhu yeah i can uh, suggest a few books like uh, uh, a brief history of time elegant universe and astronomy for dummies and astrophysics for people in hurry so these kind of books which will give you an idea yeah so uh, what i was uh, i think the question also mentioned the fact that uh, the person has some undergrad physics knowledge and maths knowledge so uh, to add to prabhu's list uh, which is uh, i think more for anyone can read uh, i would just say that you can start out with uh, the book by arna bray choudhury so he is an indian astrophysicist um, uh, who uh, was a faculty of, and i think he he retired from iit you now Uh, he wrote this book called astrophysics for physicists you know uh, the thing with that book is it's not very complicated uh, but at the same time it involves certain equations so if you have certain physics and math knowledge you can go through that and it basically covers you know a brief overview of almost you know all the stuff that is out there so it's not meant to be relevant to a certain whether it's galaxy evolution or it's mostly stellar because you have to understand stars first to you know go to galaxy level or you know to the level of cosmology you can start out using that book and there's a book by Dan Maus Astrophysics in a Nutshell which is again uh, a good start it's not very complicated but if with a brief physics knowledge and math knowledge i am pretty sure you can go through it uh, because i was when i was starting out and um, initially i didn't have that uh, physics back end so with a brief knowledge you can definitely cover these two books and i am sure it will pave a way for uh, you know those more complicated uh, books which come with the course book of astronomy and stuff and i think we will share it with you as satish mentioned so yeah okay cool all right from the questions that were submitted so this just one more i would like to take as of now and we'll see if the time permits we can i think we have covered most of it though uh, was how do we polar align uh, telescopes in cities uh, let's say if you're not able to see the north star yeah so uh... Uh, that's a great question uh, yeah. particularly if your uh, uh, if your latitude is very close to equator you know it's very hard to see polaris so you cannot rely on polaris but anyhow uh, I'll, i'll answer it with some some more examples so you can if you have uh, uh, a computerized telescope uh, you can do some uh, star alignment like one star two star and three star alignment Uh, this is for altazimuth telescope and uh, you can track the object uh, and you can observe many objects from the sky from the city city sky i mean uh, but if you have an equatorial uh, telescope if you want to perfectly track the motion of earth then you can do polar alignment like looking at the reticule like this this is a, a tracker and through this you can you can see uh, the reticule there you can see some numbers so the exact cross point is in our celestial bow and uh, uh polaris should be in one of the corners of the of the reticule so in the clockwise so you can just keep polaris as per the app and you will get pretty good tracking if you are not able to see polaris let's say if it is obstructed by trees or tall buildings then you can do a, a, an alignment method called uh, darv uh it is called drift alignment by robert weiss robert weiss method robert weiss is the person who created that it's like moving the uh, telescope pointing towards due south at declination zero and move the telescope uh, east and west i mean yeah east and west and you will see the trails of the stars when you capture long exposure so it will have a v pattern which means it is not perfectly aligned so we have to adjust the azimuth of the telescope then you will have a perfect line and then continue the same by pointing the telescope towards east and side or west and side uh, at zero declination and again do the same thing take long exposure and move north and south in that long exposure and you will have another v pattern which means it is not exactly aligned now adjust the altitude so by doing multiple iterations you know you will have a perfect a uh, line of the star which means perfectly aligned with the north celestial pole this is a indirect method but it takes some some time it's a tedious method but uh, still it works well if you are in the city sky but uh, you can 
use three star alignment some with some bright stars if you are if you have altezimuth mount that works very well cool thanks prabhu all right one more question before we went go into looking at the images so i want to learn how to use the dobsonian specifically the sky looks very different and it's very difficult to orient oneself so any guidance or resource even handling the dob is not natural and i i think what the person means is when you move the dob in a way the objects go the other way so yeah that's a fair point uh, uh avinash do you want to take a stab at that i think i would be uh, i would say incompetent to answer this question i think uh, i have been used the dob myself so if uh, anyone else wants okay, to sure. share their views on how they use the dob yeah i would learn it as well yeah sure so using the dob is first you know uh, it's kind of tricky if you're new to the dob and if you're new to the newtonian reflector particularly because when you use refractor uh, it it gives you a right view you can see it as if you see through your naked eyes but when you put a mirror inside then that's inverted and particularly if you have a schmidt cassegrain that inverts and flips the view as well so there is a mirror lens and also a diagonal so that's uh, so the best thing is and also if you want to use a dob make sure that you align the finder scope and the main scope so as long as you align it and if you find the object right in the center of the crosshair of the finder scope then you can do pretty good observation but if you are doing star hopping if you are doing serious observational astronomy i think the right person would be akash to answer so he's like uh, he's a master in uh, observational astronomy in in bas anyhow uh, so you can uh match the you can match the stars with the app and you can compare it in the view and you will know where the object is if it is closer you can just move it you can do a spiral search you will get the object within the field of view if not you have to match the star uh, in the app with the stars in the finder scope but here's the thing if you are using if you're not using a right angle finder scope then the view is inverted so here the app is giving you a right view so that you have to use a right angle finder scope so it will have a similar view so that makes it more easier in terms of finding the objects now in terms of handling the dob some of the dobs are shorter uh, like 8 inch 6 inch i don't know since i'm using uh, 16 inch i feel like the smaller dobs i mean other, other sizes are smaller but maybe uh, so when you use it you, know, you have to bend down that gives you a back pain so uh, make sure you have an observing chair like at least some some sort of chair where you can sit down uh, like i said observation comfort is more important when you sit on the chair so you have you, you both both the telescope and yourself in the same uh, angle so you can just move it around easily and make sure the moving platform the teflon generally most of the dogs has this teflon you now sometimes uh, it is not very uh, soft so you can add some bearings some ball bearings you can just buy it from from the hardware shop and put it there and it makes the movement more uh, smoother as well so that you can make it if you want to move it gently smoothly and then the movement of the altitude some dobs has the spring you know which makes it more easier some doesn't and most of the dobs has this teflon on the altitude bearing as well so that also makes it more smoother uh but you have to practice it in different angles so main important thing is you need to have a chair otherwise you will have back pain and then align the finder scope right so i i want to add one thing here on the dob um which i found personally helpful with my dob and i understand uh, because you guys are using very big telescopes and almost professional ones so one thing that helps me also is when you are locating an object one of the problems i have found is you can see it outside or you can see it on the finder scope but uh, you know until it does not come inside the view of the finder scope it's difficult to find and it's moving the opposite direction so i generally open both the eyes and from one of the eye you look at the real object let's say you want to focus on um, uh, on sirius or jupiter for example on what from one of the eyes you look at jupiter as it is straight and from the other eyes you actually keep it on the finder scope so you have an image inside the finder scope we will not initially see jupiter there now you start moving and you will see two visions because one of your eyes is out one of your says inside the uh, finder scope and when you move you will automatically get a get an idea of how to move it so that these two images are coming closer and um, you suddenly see 
uh, when you close the other eye, look at the finder scope, you'll suddenly see the bright object showing up on the finder scope. And of course then, but opening both the eyes is one of the techniques that has helped me. Um, so just wanted to add there. Yeah, I think that's a very good trick. Okay, I would just add one point there uh, that, uh, you know, uh, you need to understand the field of view. Uh, you know, what is the field of view that you're actually looking at around a star or around a pattern? If your view is 1.3 degrees or 4.3 degrees, that matters a lot. So what you do is if you're starting out, you know, uh, <clears throat> you try to find a star which is actually bright and then go around the star pattern to see, you know, uh, what pattern you see there and you you compare it against actually, you know, what pattern you see in Stellarium or, you know, Sky Eye or Sky View or something. Then you will be able to actually figure out, you know, the orientation of the sky. So <clears throat> initially that will help a lot to understand and thereby it helps a lot more in, uh, you know, star hopping actually. I just want to add a few more things. Uh, like you guys said, uh, these apps has a field of view as well. Like you can set the specification of your telescope and the finder scope and the app will show you the field of view. For example, if I'm using an eight inch top and using a 30 millimeter eyepiece, that will create a field of view for that. So you will know what stars are going to be in that field of view. And also you can create another field of view around it for the finder scope. That will be a bigger field of view around your main scope's field of view. So you will have both the field of view and you know what exactly you, you have to see. So you can adjust the telescope accordingly. That's another easy trick. And uh, Telerad finder scope uh, helps you a lot comparing to any other uh, finder scope because that gives you a transparent view of the sky. Just by looking at it, you can you will know where exactly it is and just center the crosshair and you will get it in the finder scope just to uh, you know uh, do some a little bit of movement. You can just use the finder scope and you can adjust it if it is not exactly in the center. And you can get the object in the center of field of view, just like that, in fraction of a uh, second, like in few, in few seconds, you will get it. Cool. All right, so I think we have done with all the questions that were submitted. Um, and I know we are running a little uh, late because we did start late. So um, one last thing we do want to do definitely is look at your uh, images, um, Prabhu and Avinash, right? So, uh, how about the if you could show your uh, most favorite object that uh, you think, for whatever reasons, you like it the most in, amongst the collection you have, and it could be because it was very difficult to image or whatever other reasons. Um, would you like us to show something? Maybe the top, maybe one or two objects, uh, you know, each. Yeah, um, okay. Uh, let's share my screen. I have two, two of them. Uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, this is North America Nebula. Uh, uh, this was one of my, I think, the first uh, emission nebula I observed from my setup. Um, and the fact that it is primarily emits in um, H alpha, uh, this was even more exciting for me to observe and get you know the details I could because I own a stock DSLR and uh, it's not really that sensitive. I think almost one third as sensitive as compared to an astro modified camera. So uh, at the H alpha wavelength, so uh, getting these details in you know a two to two and a half exposure, I don't know, roughly two and a half hours exposure was uh, you know the best thing that uh, at that and it motivated me to, me to you know observe more of these and then i observed in california nebula which is again a purely emission now uh, nebula so yeah this was i think the object and not only that the fact that i learned a few techniques uh, in photoshop because i was absolutely uh, i would say a, a newbie to photoshop i had no idea when i was starting out um, astrophotography how to use uh, a photoshop so learning new techniques uh, this was the first time i ever used uh, levels adjustment or curve stretching and selecting select you know, color ranges for, for example, selecting the nebulosity and enhancing them. So this is why this is kind of my one of my favorite images uh, till date. Um, my short stint of astrophotography because of all the all the reasons I just mentioned. And the second of all, uh, this recent image which I posted, I think a month back, the flame and horse head. This was a bit of a challenge uh, because I think when I process this image, maybe like back in December, uh, I could not get these details. Uh, I just could not. Uh, learning new techniques, especially in fixed insight, uh, helped me brought out a lot of this 
uh, you know, horse head red uh, emission and then all these dust and then these white emission. So yeah, I think uh, that, you know, that, that, that uh, next level in processing all that, that uh, you know, we are changing workflow over the few months, I think has helped me get these details in this image. So these are the two most favorite for me because they kind of are setting me benchmarks for how I want to improve uh, because there are a lot of things we have to um, work on. And I think one, we used to set that, like actually raised it from uh, from my own standards. So yeah, and I think uh, that's why these two form the favorite set from my own captures, you know, in the last eight or nine months. Yeah, okay, I'll stop sharing now and uh, let Prabhu take over. Yeah. I think both images are amazing, the amount of details. Yeah, thanks. So I'll uh, share my screen. So although I have some challenging images, uh, like many deep scale objects and many other things, but I find this image uh, like more close to my heart because uh, this is an image captured over 500 days, uh, capturing the entire phases of Venus and apparent uh, size changes in the sky starting from 2018 till 2020. So I didn't do it intentionally. I was just uh, going in the flow, taking planetary images as much as I could whenever I, 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 I get free time. So I just compiled everything together and thought of creating a, a, a like kind of a solar system image. So this, I made it last year. Uh, this gives you uh, different phases of Venus starting from Gibbous and then moving to Crescent and if you see the left side, that's the thinnest phase that I could, that I've captured so far. That was, I think, three four days before the apparition. And then the right side image shows uh, uh, some phases from 2018 and 19, starting from. And some images are not sharp, great because of uh, the atmospheric seeing, and then the local seeing conditions. But some are sharper, and uh, capturing Venus is not. Uh, you know, it's not easy. Uh, you can easily overexpose it. And also capturing the surface details on Venus, such as the cloud details. These are very difficult unless you have uh, a sensitive camera, uh, which is sensitive in infrared and ultraviolet. You can just blend the details from both and you can get the details. And also uh, capturing the night side of Venus, which is called as ashen light. That is also very, very difficult. Uh, thermal emission coming from the nighttime. So, these are the challenging uh, things which I'm planning to do in future with different filters, but I would say this is uh, my favorite. And also I did another version of this this year, just putting all the faces to create a mini, you know, uh, orbit around uh, around the sun. Although it's not depicting all the faces, you know, some are missing. I missed a few of the faces because of bad weather. And uh, also, I want to show one more thing. So another favorite picture is this, the great conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn, which happened in uh, 2020, December. So here you can see, this is a long exposure image just before uh, it sets. You can see the mountain in the, in, in the foreground, that's Earth and Jupiter along with its moons and Saturn along with, along with its moons. So you have so much of thing in one frame. And this site you will not get uh, in your lifetime. So having all the things in one frame, so I find it my another favorite. So yeah, but I have uh, plenty of things as well, but uh, because of time constraint, I'm not showing it. But if you guys have time, you can just check my website, Prabhu Astrophotography. There you will find all my work on all other uh, targets. Yeah, and I would highly recommend to look at the uh, the, the moon on the video, a uh, video on the moon, uh, different uh, sides of the moon. Uh, I don't know, um, uh, maybe you can show that, Prabhu. Uh, it's probably not a big video. Yeah, sure. So I'll just quickly show it.
So how many days was this entire work? Uh, this is pretty amazing, actually, the amount of details and clarity. As I was saying last time, you can almost look at different places and spots on moon and say, uh, hey, this is cool. Um, so how many days did you have to work for this? No, this uh, was captured in one night. Okay. But uh, the amount of data is a lot. Like I had to take videos for about one terabyte, I guess. Wow. Uh, every, every video, uh, each and every video was around uh, 30 GB, 40 GB something. And I took multiple panels, stacking, stitching. Uh, it took a lot of time. But uh, capturing time was just a few hours, like four, three, four hours, I would say. Just taking panel by panel. And this... Uh, 3, 3D visualization was made by Vishal. Uh, he's an uh, amateur astronomer from Delhi. So uh, he made this 3D visualization in his software from my data. So with that, you can just go in and you can see all the details in the greater in three dimension. That's pretty awesome. Thanks, Prabhu. Uh, and uh, thanks, Avinash. I think these images were really cool. So uh, any other questions? Uh, I think we are almost around time and probably it's time to wrap up. But any last questions from any final questions from, from the room? OK, cool then. Uh, in wrapping up, uh, anything you, you guys want to add? Um, I think it was. Um, Really nice talking to both of you. Uh, I learned a lot and uh, obviously you spend more time looking at the images and understanding it more now. So, but anything you guys want to say in closing? Uh, it was great uh, having me as a part in this uh, open house, being one of the panelists, uh, along with Avinash. I think uh, uh, I'm, 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 I'm looking forward for more such collaborations in future. And it's great what Bas is doing, you know, taking astronomy to each and every corner of uh, the state and also in our country. It's, it's great to see all the enthusiastic volunteers. And I'm a great fan of many of the people here, uh, like like uh, Akash, Kirti. So Kirti taught me some basics in uh, image processing when I was starting. And uh, from, Avira, uh, from Akash videos, I've learned a lot in observational astronomy. And I wish uh, I could have soon I could have joined Bas sooner when I was in India. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, I think uh, I would like to thank Bas uh, and the volunteers for uh, offering me this opportunity to be a part of this open house. That was a great uh, uh, session, and the, and first and foremost, I would also like to mention like with these sessions, not only are we sharing what we know but we also learn like for example i learned a few things from what prabhu shared with his experience with his own setup and that's something which uh, was, will constantly will stay in touch with us so the learning is always uh, never ending it always will keep on going and uh, bass has uh, definitely been a part of for me like i started astrophotography after you know encountering uh, as i said earlier uh, talking to people uh, like kirti and um, uh, Vishwa, because they were the ones who initially recommended or helped me out, okay, what I should be looking at and what I shouldn't be. So, yeah, I think uh, Bass is doing a great job at it, and I, and I hope to see more such astrophotographers coming out of India, you know, and um, uh, putting up great work. So, yeah, thank you, uh, and thank you all the volunteers for uh, being a part of this. You know? Cool. Thank you for taking time. Uh, thanks to both of you as well, and sharing your thoughts, and also Thanks to everyone behind the scenes who has putting this together. So um, uh, Sudash and uh, Kirti and Vishwa and others. Uh, Sudash, maybe you can add if I'm not mentioning anyone because there are so many. But thanks to everybody. No, I think uh, special mention to Satish for you know uh, creating a band of uh, brand of uh, you know open house in uh, BIS. Let us hope that you know more sessions actually continue like this, and let us actually you know. Uh, create enthusiasm across uh, you know the board of all uh, we have close to 700 uh, you know participants so we have to make sure that they all become active now <laughs> so that's one of our job so <clears throat> thank you prabhu and uh, thank you avanash in spite of all your you know busy times and uh, 
rest days of you know sundays and all that we have actually robbed all of your you know rest and it is thanks for participating and also thanks to special thanks to uh, you know <clears throat> uh, rithika litika and uh, you know shubendu for uh, volunteering into the session uh, you know uh, they managed the you know mute unmute and mute questions in youtube questions in you know uh, zoom windows and all that so so thanks to them and uh, special thanks to vishwa inspect for such you know uh, schedule busy busy schedule you know he made made sure that you know he logged in and uh, you know uh, rectified the youtube issue apart from that thank you for all the you know people who participated on uh, on a sunday uh, we know we robbed your session hopefully you learned something uh, <clears throat> hopefully if you have not actually joined uh, bis telegram group please do join uh, visit our website uh, you know bis.org.in and uh, you get to register <clears throat> and uh, uh, once you register the link of the telegram group will actually appear to yourself so uh, please do that and hopefully <clears throat> we'll have you know more open house uh, you know sessions uh, satish with your closing remarks then you can actually close oh, all right now well, thanks sadash and thanks everybody uh, all i can say is um, it's uh, uh, what keeps us going is uh, like avinash was saying it's the learning bit as well we also learn when we attend and do these kind of sessions so i, I will hope to have more sessions uh, but not for general topics but maybe more focus topics like astrophotography astrophysics maybe next time or, or maybe some other topics and hopefully we'll do more so thank you so much and uh, do join us then so have a have a good uh, rest of the day and weekend see you then bye bye see you everyone sal thank you bye bye prabhu bye avinash bye sadesh bye sadesh see you guys bye see you guys yeah.